Folks, as I was planning my sermons for this summer, there were two Sundays left over between the two series that I wanted to cover. And um, so I decided to preach on two of the Ten Commandments. Now, years ago, I preached through all Ten Commandments, and perhaps these two will whet your appetites for more, and if, in which case, you can go and find them on our website. But these are two commandments that I want to highlight because I believe that they address areas where our culture has really crept into the church. Today we're going to be looking at the third commandment, do not take God's name in vain. And one of God's most beautiful gifts to man is the gift of speech. And it's an absolute tragedy when people take that gift, that beautiful, beautiful gift of speech, and then misuse it. Really, pretty much all of the gifts have been misused in this world, in this lifetime. One misuse of that gift is to hurt other people with the tongue. And the Bible says this in James 3, 9. With it, that is the tongue, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. And what a sad thing that people would take God's gift of speech and then use it to harm one another. But think of this, it's even sadder when we take that same gift, that beautiful gift of language and use it to abuse and misuse the very name of God himself, the God who created each and every one of us. In fact, this issue is so important to God that Jesus addresses it in a roundabout way when he taught his disciples how to pray. Do you remember that? In Matthew chapter 6, this is how Jesus opened his prayer with these words. He says, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's the opposite, really, of taking God's name in vain. We are, to, we are to, to uplift it, to keep it holy. Instead, we are to take a moment at the beginning of our prayers, as Jesus said right here, and honor it. So with that thought, please open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 20. And let's, let's stand together for the reading of God's word Ten Commandments are found in two places in God's Word, in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. We'll be looking at the Exodus 20 account. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 7. As a matter of fact, in our, in our family devotions, we are right now, we just finished covering the Ten Commandments, and we took a, a while to do that just to make sure that... Um, Everybody knows exactly what they say and what they don't say. So here it is, verse 1, Exodus 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Here it is, number 1, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Number 2 is found in verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. There's Elkanah, for you guys have been in our, in our Wednesday night series there. He says, I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now here's the third commandment, verse seven. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And I also like the way that the New Revised Standard Version translates this verse. Listen carefully. This says, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. You may be seated. Folks, in my humble opinion, I would have to say this, that this is probably one of the most broken of the Ten Commandments, out of all of the Ten Commandments. 
We can't go anywhere, even the playground today, without hearing the name of our great God and King trampled underfoot all around us. And yet God attaches some terrifying words to this commandment. Again, Exodus 20, verse 7, For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. God is not like you and I who, who maybe make uh, empty threats. That's not our God. Now, we'll look at that more closely in a little bit. But for now, the question we need to consider is this. Why does God take this sin so seriously? Well, first, God's name is much, much more than just a word. One theologian put it like this. I've got a couple quotes for you. God's name is that by which he is called, that by which he is made known to us, and that by which his nature and his perfections are revealed to us. And then the reformer John Calvin said the following, God would that the majesty of his name be held by us in untouchable holiness. Whatever we might say or think about him should taste of his splendor. It should correspond to the holy grandeur of his name, and it should contribute to the praise of his glory. Amen. Well said. And one last author said this. To understand the severity of taking the Lord's name in vain, we must first see the Lord's name from his perspective, as outlined in Scripture. God's nature and attributes the totality of his being, and especially his glory are reflected in his name, end quote. You think about all the names in the Old Testament, they pretty much all had meanings attached to them, and that, hence the name that was given to a person. I don't believe my, my mother, when she was naming me, had that same view in mind. I think Carrie means lover of horses. Well, if you know anything about Carrie, <laughs> that's certainly not the case. <laughs> So, but back in the Old Testament, that was different, the Hebrew culture. Do you realize that there's no record of anyone, not Abraham, not Noah, not even Adam and Eve being told God's name in the book of Genesis? So far as we know, God first told Moses from the flames of the burning bush what his name was. That's found in Exodus 3, verses 13 and 14. There's a couple pages behind where you're at right now. I'll just read them for you. Then Moses said to God, behold, I am going to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Great question, Moses. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now this Name translated I am is a four letter Hebrew word which originally had no vowels in it. As a matter of fact, the original Hebrew language had no vowels attached to it. And so that is Y H W H, or as we pronounce it, Yahweh. These Jewish scribes who copied scripture by hand took special pains when writing the very name of God. And whenever they came to the secondary name of God, or I should say a secondary name of God, like El or El Shaddai or Elohim, they would stop, they would put down their pens, take up a new pen and carefully write that name. But whenever they came to the primary principal name of God, the name Yahweh, they would rise from their seats go into their personal quarters, get this, bathe, dress in clean clothes, return to the workplace. There then, then they would kneel down, confess their sins, take up a new pen, dunk it once in an inkwell, and finally write those four letters, Y-H-W-H. Now, Compare that with our culture. Who so flippantly, so many use God's name in such an irreverent manner today. So unlike the scribes in the Old Testament. 
However, that being said, the Jews misunderstood and misapplied this commandment themselves. In an attempt to avoid ever misusing God's name, they made an extra biblical law that it was never to be spoken audibly. As a matter of fact, if they heard me trying to say that, they would take me outside and and stone me back then. It was forbidden to try to even pronounce it. And though their intentions from, from our vantage point were no doubt good, that was never what God had intended by the third commandment. Thus, the third commandment has nothing to do with avoiding God's name. The Jews completely missed the entire point of the law, and they focus on the outward wooden obedience to this commandment, and in so doing, they ignored the heart intention behind it. God did intend for his name to be used, And he intended it for at least two reasons. Number one, to praise, glorify, and worship him. That's one legitimate reason why we should use his name. And the second is to teach others about him, both evangelistically and in a sanctifying manner. So the third commandment was not forbidding the use of his name, but rather the misuse of his name. And that's our third point here. God's name is not to be misused. The key to understanding this commandment lies in the proper interpretation of the phrase in vain. This Hebrew expression means to use God's name in a light, you might want to write this down, in a light, loose, or casual way. That's what it means. One of my all-time favorite preachers said this, to take his name in vain means to use his name in an inappropriate, hollow, empty, or meaningless way. Now let me repeat that once again. To take his name in vain means to use his name in an inappropriate, hollow, empty, or meaningless way. And one more quote from another author, he said this, the use of God's name in a degrading or in any way disrespectful manner expresses an attitude of disdaining the relationship we are supposed to have with him. Having a relationship with God demands that we represent him accurately, sincerely, and respectfully, end quote. Some of these quotes are just too good. I I have to include these because they're so well said. Now, having looked at what the third commandment means, let's look at some of the most common ways in which we break this commandment. And I'm going to give you some ways to keep us from breaking it at the very end of today's message. But let's look at some of the ways that we commonly break this commandment. And this is really the reason why I wanted to come to you with this message today, because of, the, because of what I've seen even in this church, men and women. So we all need to examine ourselves. Most people have very little idea how broad this commandment is and, and, and in how many ways it touches our everyday life. So the first and most obvious way that someone can break the third commandment is through profanity. That is using God's name or that of his son or that of the Holy Spirit in an abusive, vulgar, and irreverent way. Now here I'm thinking primarily of two kinds of people. The first person uses God's name in a defiant manner. He advertises his rebellion against God by deliberately misusing his name. Now the second person is much more common. This person flippantly, carelessly, and thoughtlessly uses God's name in everyday conversation, thus showing that he has little respect or regard for God, though he would probably say otherwise if you were to ask him. And folks, this is where I think most American Christians, you know, the 67% of Americans who, who claim to be Christians, are probably at. 
Our culture has no problem in using God's name all the time in, in every possible circumstance, correct? They've even started using God's initials um, in, in, prof, in a profane manner. We hear such profanity so often that we might start thinking, um, start thinking about it, excuse me, start thinking that it's normal, barely paying attention to it. And from there, it's really just one small step to actually saying it ourselves, like repeating it when we tell a story and, a, and try to quote somebody else who said it. Young people, do not be deceived. Listen to me very carefully. Using the Lord's name, all right? Using the Lord's name or even his initials. And I'm thinking of OMG right now. And quotes or re repeating it in a quote that someone else said is still taking his beautiful name in vain. Watching movies or television shows where you know that that is going to be used, that profane God's holy name should not even be an option for the man or woman who says that they know and love God. Why are we gonna go pay someone to entertain us who uses his holy name in such a blasphemous manner? Remember what Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, he must, first thing, deny himself. There's a lot of things that I do not watch, right, or do not listen to, because I, although I want to, I would like to, but I simply don't, because I need to deny myself, right, for the sake, in this sense, of, of keeping God's name holy. And so when a believer confronts another believer about breaking the third commandment, the most likely response that you will hear is this, oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't even aware that I, that I did that. Or I didn't mean any disrespect. God knows my heart, right? And, and you can, hey, I'm thankful for that. I'm, it's good. But does either excuse absolve him or her of their responsibility? And the answer is absolutely not. A careless, thoughtless, flippant use of God's name is hugely insulting to the Almighty. And why? Because it means that the person thinks so lightly of God that he can use his name without even being aware of it. People dishonor God's holy name Think about this, in every emotional state known to man, when they're mad, you hit your thumb <laughs> with a hammer, excuse me, when you're happy, when you're scared, when you're disgusted, when you're hurt, when you're surprised, or for simple, meaningless punctuation, all without any real regard for God himself. And that's our culture. And that's what all of us have grown up in. I should say probably most of us. And so I want to challenge all of you, dear brothers and sisters, to understand that this is sin, plain and simple, and God hates it. So I want to challenge all of you, both old and young, grandparents and teenagers alike, this is for everyone here, all right, here and, uh, and online, to really consider how you use God's holy name. And consider what you say, all right? Consider what you watch. Consider what you listen to. And for you young people out there, consider what you text. Consider what you text. We can probably go on and on. So why am I even saying this to this group of believers, to my church family here? Once again, because I believe that this sin has sadly crept into the church. Over the past decade, big name preachers have begun using profanity in their sermons in order, they say, to reach a generation of people who only understand that kind of language. But folks, make no mistake, God hates all profanity, and there is never a good reason for using it. 
And that's why Jesus said what he did in Matthew chapter 12. He said this in verse 34, you brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of what? That which fills the heart. So people don't have a cursing problem. They have a what? A heart problem, what Jesus says here. Now he goes on. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. The evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. Yikes. Folks, did you notice the inescapable terminology in that last verse? Every careless word and Paul was just as clear in his letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Once again, no unwholesome word, only such a word as is good. And folks, listen, I know many of you work in environments where that's all you hear every single day. But what better way to stand out as, and we're going to get to this in our, I've already worked on these two sermons, in our Sermon on Mount uh, series, our Life of Christ sermon series, what better way to show that you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world than how you speak? It's one of the most obvious things about you. And when your speech is so much different than everyone else's, they're going to say, what's wrong with you? (laughs) That's okay. So brothers and sisters, young people, children, we will have to give an account for our words, each and every one of them, before God Almighty. And so do you want to stand before him filled with awe at his indescribable glory and have to confess that you dragged his name through the muck of human emotions and unguarded speech? Now, that's just the first way. The second way that this commandment can be broken is when we swear. That is when we use God's name to back up our promises. I used to do this all the time as a kid. You probably did too. Adults still do this all the time in courts of law. However, Jesus' instructions are rather quite clear in Matthew chapter 5. He said, again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. And then Jesus goes on, but I say to you, make no oath at all either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. Brothers and sisters, your very words, your every word should be enough for sterling honesty should be a part of every believer's character. James wrote this in James 5, 12, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven, and that's what he means by making an oath, right? Either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. It's exactly what James was thinking of. Now, a, a third way in which his name is taken in vain is through humor. That is, without the proper reverence it deserves. I really believe that most jokes about God fall into this category. Now, if someone makes a joke about Moses or Peter, I typically don't have a problem with that as long as it's done in good taste, (laughs) and neither should you probably. God created us with a sense of humor, so don't hear me saying that laughing is wrong, not at all. But our great and glorious God should never be the subject of our jokes. Never, never, ever, ever. Many so-called funny Christian t-shirts, bumper stickers, slogans are, in my opinion, borderline at best. Even some things on the Babylon Bee. You guys know what I'm talking about? 
they thought were borderline blasphemous. Some of them were funny. Some of them thought, "Mm mm-mm. Parents take time to really consider if they portray God in a biblical reverence. All of you, take that time and think about that. Neither God nor his name should ever be taken as a big joke. Now, fourth, very common way in which the third commandment is broken is the use of God's name in worship, but that worship is done in a careless, thoughtless manner. Even in our religious activities, we can be breaking this commandment and dishonoring God if we're not consciously and reverently using his name. Think about it. When we sing songs of worship, but our minds are not actively engaged on the, on the words, right? On the God behind those words uh, to whom we're singing, we're not treating him or his name reverently. When we pray using God's holy name throughout our prayer, but we're not really thinking of, of him, that's also irreverently using his name. We're just on autopilot, right? Partic- or punctuating our prayers with God's name as often as we would insert commas has no worthwhile purpose and it certainly does not honor our great God. Rather, it's taking his name, I believe, in vain. As most of you know, um, the Lord saved me while I was studying up at Western Washington University in the 90s in Bellingham. And there I got involved in, the men's, in, in several men's Bible studies. And one study in particular had a somewhat charismatic bent to it. And I still remember how some of those men prayed, working themselves almost up into a frenzied state. And they tried to speak God, they try to speak their prayers really as loudly and God's name as loudly and rapidly as they could. And they would use the Lord's name multiple times in almost every sentence. And that bothered me even as a new Christian back then. I don't know why it bothered me. And back then I would not have been able to tell you which scriptures address this issue, but I can now. Listen to the words of our Lord in Matthew chapter 6. When you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. And he says this, verse 8, so do not be like them. Or what about Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 and 2? Guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they are doing evil. And then he says this in verse two, do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Now we need to balance that, right? With like 1 Thessalonians five seventeen, which says pray at all times. There's a balance there. There's wisdom there. Brothers and sisters, God's name is too holy, too precious, too glorious to be used in a shallow, haphazard manner, even in our songs and worship. Now, a fifth way in which a person can misuse the name of our Lord is to claim to be a Christian, but then to live in contradiction of that name. Now, we don't usually consider this as breaking the third commandment, but think, think through this with me. When you claim to be a Christian, then you are taking upon yourself the name of who? Christ. And there's nothing wrong with it. As a matter of fact, it's a biblical term. You can look in Acts 11, verse 26, where it's first used. But if we do wear his name, then we must wear it with a proper respect and reverence for him, for we are representing him. And if we don't live the way that he lived, and yet we call ourselves by his name, then we are in a very real way misusing his name. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself right now, okay, pastor, that seems a bit of a stretch. I might have thought so too at one point in time, but listen to some passages 
of God's word. We'll start with Isaiah 48.1. God speaking to Israel, hear this, O house of Jacob, who are named Israel, and who came forth from the loins of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth nor in righteousness. In other words, they weren't walking according to the truth or according to holiness or righteousness. Israel used the name of God, but they did not obey God's word. And by their disobedience, they violated the third commandment. Another example is King David, when he committed adultery and murder. God came to him through the the prophet Nathan and said that the child from their unholy union with Bathsheba, the, the baby that she was carrying, would die. And the reason he gave to David was because of this, and I quote in 2 Samuel 12, 14, you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. How did David discredit God's name among the heathen? David was so closely identified with the God of Israel that he was even called a man after God's own heart in both the Old and New Testament. 1 Samuel 13, 14, Acts 13, 22. But when he sinned and then tried to cover up his sin, he was acting like the heathen. And because of David's hypocrisy, God's name was being dragged through the mud. It was being maligned. Now, you might be thinking, well, pastor, that's, those are simply Old Testament examples about Israel. It's certainly not the same for us today. Oh, but it is. Just as Israel represented God to the Gentile world, now the church represents God to the unbelieving world, both Jew and Gentile. And as such, we need to represent him appropriately, properly, reverently, accurately. Jesus addressed this in Luke 6. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? In other words, if you're going to call him Lord, which means what? Master, then you better do what he says. In other words, those who profess Christ and live under his name yet refuse to obey him are clearly breaking this commandment. Okay, how about Paul in the book of Romans? He said this in Romans 2. You who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, you dishonor God. Do you dishonor God? Excuse me. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. Folks, how many times over the years have you met people say, I don't go to church because the church is full of hypocrites? (laughs) Apparently, some of you have heard that in the past. (laughs) This is exactly what it's talking about here. If you're going to wear his name, you better live like you really do follow him. People who claim to be believers but don't, don't obey him, that is who break his law, actually blaspheme God's name. I met so many people like this over the years. They swear, they lie, they li- live in sexual immorality, they drink, they smoke, they claim to be Christians. Brothers and sisters, such people are a dishonor to Christ. And by calling them, themselves Christians, they're taking God's name in vain. Paul addressed this issue again when he wrote to Titus, Titus 1.16. They profess to know God, but by their deeds, what? You guys can read. What does it say? They deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Yikes. One more, the Apostle John. In 1 John 2.4, the one who says, I have come to know him, I'm a Christian, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is is not in him. Again and again and again, we see that those who call themselves Christians and yet live in ongoing, and that's the key word here, or key phrase, ongoing disobedience to the commandments of God actually dishonor his name. Brothers and sisters, do you take Christ's name upon yourself and call yourself a Christian? Maybe call yourself a believer, a disciple? But do you then unsay with your life what you say with your lips? If so, then you either need to change your life or you need to change your name. 
Does that make sense? We take God's name in vain when the life we live is inconsistent with the God we claim to serve. And God warns us that there are serious consequences for committing this sin. Let's look at our verse once again, particularly the last part. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Here it is, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Folks, you realize that this is no idle threat? It's simply a statement of fact. You will be punished. One theologian that I read said that it is the calmly awful fact of eternity. It's like the law of gravity. The law of gravity says that if you step off a roof of a 30-story building, you will die. That's not a threat, because the threat has the potential to happen or not to happen. It's a fact. God says in Exodus 20, verse 7, a fact. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Again, this is not an empty threat like parents so often give to their children. Take God's name lightly, men and women, boys and girls, and you will be punished. Are you surprised? Don't be. Hollywood celebrities pay millions each year to protect their names. Companies like Apple, Boeing, Google hire lawyers to ensure that their corporate name or even logo is not misused. Well, God's name is important to him as well. Misuse it, and he will see you in court. Listen to the words of Moses when at the end of his life he recapped for the younger generation the law which had originally been given audibly to their parents. Deuteronomy 28, 58 and 59. He says this, if you are not careful to observe all the words of this law which are written in this book to fear this honored and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring extraordinary plagues on you and your descendants, even severe and lasting plagues and miserable and chronic sicknesses. Moses told the people of Israel they could expect physical ramifications for specifically violating this commandment. And this passage certainly was aimed at Old Testament Israel, but I do believe that God might use sickness even today in punishment for this sin. Certainly our society is plagued with, and I quote, miserable and chronic sicknesses. I think we spend more money on doctors um, than any, I know this, than any other country in the world, by far. And could it not be the result of taking his name so lightly? In which case we broadcast this, our music and our movies, even our worship services around the world? One pastor said, abuse of God's name is no trivial matter. Why? Why? Almost every, listen carefully, almost every other sin gives some sort of passing pleasure. Think about it. As a matter of fact, that is why we lust after sins for the passing pleasure. However, this sin has no fleshly reward. It is a sin of pure rebellion. It is a pointless and senseless defying of God, and God hates it, end quote. thought that was so well said. <laughs> Now, please turn your Bibles with me to Leviticus, and let's look at a very sobering story. Leviticus 24, next book over. Page 165. (laughs) My Bible, if that's helpful. That was a joke, by the way. Okay, verse 10. Now the son of an Israelite woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the sons of Israel and the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel struggled with each other in the camp. Verse 11. 
Exodus 24, 11. The son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name and cursed. So they brought him to Moses. Now his mother's name was Shilamith, the daughter of Debri, the tr- of the tribe of Dan. They put him in custody so that the command of the Lord might be made clear to them. Verse 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, bring the one who has cursed outside the camp and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head and let all the congregation stone him. You shall speak to the sons of Israel saying, if anyone curses his God, then he will bear his sin. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the, all the congregation shall certainly stone him. The alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Now skip down to verse 22. There shall be one standard for you. It shall be for the stranger as well as the native, for I am the Lord your God. Then Moses spoke to the sons of Israel, and they brought the one who had cursed outside the camp and stoned him with stones. Thus the sons of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now this Old Testament example shows just how much God hates this sin. But maybe you're thinking, oh, Pastor Kerry, that was then and this is now. Surely God understands that the culture that we now live in, and this is just how people speak today. Brothers and sisters, Might I remind you that God is immutable? That means that his character never changes. He is perfect from a thousand years ago to today, from eternity past to eternity future. God will never grow, He will never change, He will never learn something new. He knows it all. The Ten Commandments are a part of God's moral law, and God's morals never change. So, I told you that there are cures for this sin of breaking this commandment. So what are they? I'm so glad you guys asked me. I tell you, I'm constantly amazed by Scripture's ability to pinpoint the root cause of a problem Jesus says that the real problem lies not in the mouth, but again, we read earlier, where? In the heart. Matthew 12, 34, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So to clean up our mouths, we need to change what's going on in our hearts. Think about how this is true for each of the ways that people break this commandment, the ones that we already looked at. Let's start off with profanity. Profanity comes out of a dirty heart men and women. That's where it comes from. If you easily take the Lord's name in vain, you need to ask yourself if you're even saved. Okay? If you're not, then your problem is much bigger than just a dirty mouth, and you need to get saved today. Fall on your knees, repent from your sins, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says you, he will save you you will be saved. If, however, you are a believer, then fall on your face before him and ask him for forgiveness for misusing his names. name. 1 John 1, 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, and I love this next part, from how much? All unrighteousness. The older I get, the more forgetful I am. But he doesn't forget. The cure for a dirty mouth, men and women, is a clean heart. Number two, swearing in order to be believed comes out of a deceitful heart. Only a liar has to swear to back up his word. So the cure for a swearing mouth is a truthful heart. Ask forgiveness for your lies and pursue telling the truth as carefully as you can wherever you are, whatever the cost. What about unholy joking? That comes from an irreverent heart. Confess your sin of not treating God as holy. Get to know him better so that you're so floored by him, you're so awed by him that you can never take him or his name lightly ever again. 
So the cure for ungodly joking is a reverent heart. What about thoughtless worship? Well, that comes from a superficial heart. Men and women, I think as Americans, and our culture has trained us in this, most people say that you can never, ever preach for an hour or never even give young people, you have to give them like one or two minute sound bites and that's all they can handle. It's because our culture has trained us like this, right? So I would say this, confess your lazy, superficial heart. Because that's what our culture has become. We're lazy and we're superficial. So strive to be so in love with God that your heart and mind are naturally engaged in your worship of Him. So the cure for a mindless worship is a focused heart. And it's going to take some time to untrain what we've been so deeply trained in. And finally, ungodly, ungodly living under the name of Christian comes from a hypocritical heart. Christ saved his harshest words not for the prostitutes, not for the, the, the fornicators, not for the demon-possessed, not for the tax collectors, but he saved his harshest words for who? The hypocrites. People who claimed to know him but by their lives, they denied him. So the cure for hypocrisy is an obedient heart. Brothers and sisters, if God has shown any of you today that you have been breaking this third commandment in any way, then come to him today in contrite repentance. Ask him to forgive you for taking his so precious name so lightly and then begin to fill your, hit your own heart with his word. Why? Because through his word, he will renew your heart and mind and cleanse your tongue. If you fill your mind with high and holy thoughts of our high and holy God, you will not use his name casually. And when you fill your mind with God's word, the old careless words will no longer flow so easily from your mouth. Instead, you will learn to speak reverent words about our holy God, wholesome words that edify, help, and encourage those who hear them. Instead of being poor excuses for followers of Jesus Christ who carry his name all around you, let us be the passionate disciples of his speaking of and to him with the greatest love and respect that we could possibly muster. Amen? I'm going to conclude like this. The following poem was in recent years quoted by a well-known preacher, Steve Lawson. And there's no way I can compete with Steve Lawson. But originally, it was found in the papers of a young African pastor in Zimbabwe who was, who was martyred for his faith. And here it is. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I will not look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My path, or my past is redeemed, my present makes sense, my future is secure. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, love by patience, live by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, nor meander in the maze of mediocrity. I will not give up, back up, let up, shut up until I have prayed up, preached up, stored up, and stayed up the cause of Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until he returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, he will have no trouble recognizing me. My colors are flying high, 
and they are clear for all to see. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. My question is, are you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words. Thank you for the reminder that we are to be different, Lord, wholly different. And it begins, all begins in our, in our heart, but it's evidenced so clearly by our mouth. So Lord, where we have failed, I thank you for Jesus Christ and his perfect forgiveness. I thank you for the perfect sacrifice that he made on the cross 2,000 years ago to free us, to cleanse us from our sins, not just some of them, but all of them. Now, Lord, strengthen us through your spirit. Convict us where we need to grow and change, and we all need to grow and change. And thank you again for the forgiveness that we have alone through Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray this for your glory, your honor, and your praise. And all God's people said,